This is a recording with Reverend Dr. Timothy To, Ascension number 002007, Real 10. And that's how the song, mm -hmm. the song became an inspiration. Yeah, yeah. That, then um, it was very stirring, the, the, the tune. Yeah. Mm. Right. The tune is to Annie Laurie, mm. one of the beautiful Scots folk songs, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a love song. To Annie Laurie. Mm -hmm. It's written in Thanksgiving. Hmm? It's written in Thanksgiving for the... It is uh, a song to inspire them to give. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Now, closer to Bula House would be a song they have written about Life Church. Come, come, come to Life yeah, Church. Yeah, yeah, that was you written to... many years ago. Do you want to comment on that? Well, again, it's a, a tune that... Uh, stir up the emotions, and it's a tune of the church in the wild wood. Mm. It's a very famous song. And every time I go to the international conference, the group from Central America will sing the song. Every time they'll sing the song. Mm. Well, that strikes a, re a responsive chord in my heart. So when I came back, I, I wrote on modified from that Church in the Wildwood. So it's a sort of a parody, not exactly, but I borrow some ideas from there, then I depart from there to write my song. <laughs> and uh, Come, Come, Come is the same, All right. Come to Life Church. Right. Would you consider that as a theme song for the church? So now that becomes a theme song for the church, and every Life Church anniversary will sing this. <laughs> right. Only, only once a year we sing this. Right. right. Okay. Closer Back Home would be the song written Singapura. Oh, that uh, that is uh, my prize song. Mm -hmm. How so? It was a uh, second last day of our stay in Israel. We stayed there five and a half months. Mm. At that time, Jamima was in my arms. We went there when she was 18 months. We came back when she was uh, exactly two years. Mm. So we went to Ashdod. It's one of the seaside, one of the ports of Israel. If you look at the map, you are Ashdod. And we went to the seaside. Carlson brought me along and said, well, you are leaving for home. And it was January. And although it was winter, that it was a very sunny day, so I went to the beach. And when I saw the blue ocean, and when I came to Singapore, at once I, I, I thought of Singapore. See? Mm. So at once the words flow, oh, fairest isle of southern seas, the mm -hmm. waters are so blue. Mm. The first two lines came right, right away. Right. So I got back to the house, and I finished it that evening. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's a tune to America. Right. But Singapore fits with America. Oh, America, Singapore, Singapore. And that is also a patriotic song. It is a song of America. So I wrote Singapore, also based on the patriotic feelings of the song to America. Mm. And then uh, during that time, after I came back, there was 1970, 71, 72. The Straits Times had a poet's corner that was under the charge of Kirpal Singh. Mm. He is now professor of, of English, I think, in the That's U. Right. So I submitted several of my poems and I got three prizes for three poems I submitted. Mm. But when I submitted this one, I got a first prize. Mm -hmm. And the Kerbal Singh was very happy. He said, this is a good anthem actually for our nation because he talks of God. Mm. <laughs> he, although he's a singer, mm. he's happy he said, because he talks of God. We should write a tune for this to be sung. Mm. And then they gave me $35 <laughs> first prize. Right, right. So since then, life has been singing it on National Day. So I... Ever since I've written that, I have uh, sung it for live trips now. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Other churches, except Fairfield, one day, Benin Tsung, one of our members, brought this song to the Fairfield Methodist Church. Mm. I said, this is written by my pastor, you know. Mm-hmm. That's a very good song. So uh, Fairfield Methodist adopted and they sang it for the National Day. <laughs> That's the only instance I hear that some other church sings. Right, right. But we sing it in the church, you see, because this is a church praying for the nation. Mm. And whether the nation would like to sing this or not, maybe after I die, mm-hmm. they will want to sing it. Right, <laughs> not now. Right, right, uh. right. Okay, one, just one more song. Our God is a loving Father. Well, this is very interesting. Mm. I went to Melbourne, 1989 and 1990. Mm-hmm. Each time I went there, I spent 10 weeks to nurture the young church. Mm. And uh, when I got there, there is this fellow called Patrick Lee. Mm. He was a young man, and they were going to Brisbane as a church family, I think um, I think two families got together in one van and they were driving to Brisbane. When on the way they met with a fatal accident, the, the van crashed into a tree. And uh, the, I think at least one, I think two people died. Mm. But Patrick Lee would have died if he did not change position. Before the accident, he changed position to the back and a young man, I think his treasurer of the church, went to the front and he was killed. So Patrick Lee got converted Mm. through this uh, traumatic experience and he became a new new man. He was still a student in the university, I think, just just beginning. Mm -hmm. Now he has some musical talent and he wrote several tunes. And uh, of the three tunes, I've used two. And the Lord, uh, our, our, our God is a loving Father. He, he wrote this tune, it sounds very stately and it's fitting for a sound. Mm. So I wrote the, on this tune, I wrote, The Lord our God is a loving Father. And it's based on Psalm 103. Mm. And so, I've sung this so called Psalm, and it's a Psalm mm. in our church for quite a few times. Mm. And um, it has been sung by other churches too. Right. So, this is out of my contact with Australia, mm. Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Generally, when you wrote all these um, songs, do you have a targeted audience in mind, or was it...? Yeah, we have like a Beulah house, Beulah land, targeted to the live congregation. Mm-hmm. But this is a very general one, right. as a good worship psalm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Likewise for songs on yeah. the Holy Land, yeah, too. Yeah. Right. Any sp- particular song that actually um, gave fulfillment to your life? Well, I would say the FEBC anthem mm-hmm. will be perpetuated in the college. Mm-hmm. And I feel proud about it because other colleges they just pick one of the songs and say, Without My Vision, mm-hmm. that is Singapore Bible College. But ours is especially, especially tailored out of the mm. tears and the struggles of the heart. I think. Yeah. Um, Reverend, moving away from songs to books, I understand that you have written perhaps more than 30 books. Yes. Um, would you like to comment on one of the tough, toughest books that you have written? All right. And the greatest, I think, is Calvin's Institutes a Bridge. Mm-hmm. That's on the top there. Mm. You took three to four years to complete that. I took um, maybe 
about two years to finish books one and two. Mm -hmm. And then thereafter, I took another one or two years to finish three and four. Mm -hmm. But I didn't publish book three and four until very lately. Mm -hmm. The reason is that book one and two, I printed 7,000 copies. Mm -hmm. And I sent 1,000 to Dr. McIntyre in America, where they distributed and so forth. And I had 6,000. And uh, I was quite a daring fellow to print so many, you know. Mm. And um, how the money came, I don't know. I, I forget how we, I got the money. Mm. But it was printed. And it took all these years to consume the remaining 6,000. Mm. So I was constrained to print it as one book mm -hmm. when it came to the end of the 6,000 because there's no more. Mm -hmm. But before we came to 6,000, I said, well, what do I print? We want to sell all this. We sell and we distribute. And the white book, the first two uh, books in, in, in one volume was very saleable. Mm. Dr. Stephen Tong, you have heard of him? Mm -hmm. Bought 200 copies for his seminary. Mm. And uh, this is an illustration of how the books had a very popular sale. Mm. What inspired you to, to write the abridgment of Kelvin Institute? Because when I went to faith seminary in America and I learned all the subjects, Greek and Hebrew and all the theology and so forth, and we came to the theology of John Calvin. Mm. And met there as a group because Calvin is a theologian of theologians because when he writes, it's quite different from others. Mm. And he writes most uh, progressively and logically and very powerfully and most deeply. Mm -hmm. So I was a first year student and was introduced to Calvin's Institutes. I was so gripped by it that in the following summer, four months, no, no, uh, the following summer, uh, uh, three, uh, three to four months in America, I used a Chambers Dictionary to read the four books of Calvin, 160, 1,600 pages. Mm. With the dictionary, I still had the book where I annotated the, the deep meanings mm. of words. Mm. So I was completely sold to Calvin's theology because Suddenly I realized that I have a sovereign God who controls everything. Mm. I, I did not know this because of the green horn that I came to seminary. Mm. And that he saves us and saves us forever. Mm -hmm. Once saved, always saved. Oh, I was very happy mm -hmm. to learn this. Mm -hmm. So when I came back to Singapore to teach in 1962, I began to teach Calvin and as I taught the course, I began to abridge. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then lately, because we're coming to the end of the sales of the white book, the, the first volume, mm -hmm. then I got books three and four yeah. type out and we printed as one book. Right. And this is about two years ago. Right. Now, Dr. Tu, you have written a variety of books. Um, what actually inspired you to write? Just like what inspired you to write the series? Well, it started by writing a biography. Mm. Joshua Lim, do you know, he's the elder of Calvary. Mm -hmm. And his son is... And his son is uh, a minister now. But Lim. Lim Boon Heng, Lim Boon Kiong, mm. uh, John. My memory is very bad these days. Mm -hmm. Anyway. David Lim. David Lim, that's right. David Lim, his father is Joshua Lim, elder of Calvary. He's now partly settled in Perth. Mm. He shuttles between. And his father is called Lim Pui Hien. And Lim Pui Hien was a disciple of John Sung. And Lim Pui Hien in his days saved 
thousands, where Johnson said 10,000. Mm. He was a lesser light, but he also was a very good evangelist. So he was my good friend because my first wife was safe under him, mm. Nancy. And therefore, we become good friends. Of course, I'm much younger than he. So, he was quite sad like, because uh, his ministry was short-lived. Not that he died, but he had about five years of very powerful ministry. But mm. after that, his sermons were not received mm. on repentance and sin. The people's hearts were became hardened. Pardon. So he had a small ministry, preaching in small churches, here or there, without much result. And then um, he retired in a son's house and lived there for several years. Mm -hmm. At that time, they stayed at Mang Siu, mm -hmm. quite near here. And so he died in, at the age of 74, quite suddenly. So the son was quite sad and wept and so forth. Then I comforted him. I said, uh, don't cry. Your father is my good friend and he lived a very great life. Mm. All right, lah, I promise to write the book to comfort you. Mm. Because I uttered this word. Mm -hmm. So that's the first book I wrote. Mm -hmm. Do you have a copy of that? No. Biography. In John Su Steps, the story of Lim Poi Hien. Mm. I spent quite a lot of time research from all his books and papers and diaries and records and wrote up the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems that the way I write it and so forth was very readable. I didn't know that I could write. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time. Mm -hmm. So I think it was the year 1975 or 76 I first wrote. And uh, this is after I've already written songs. Mm. But this was the first book I wrote. Mm. Uh, no, no. I cannot... No, no, no. I, I think the date is wrong. Not, not 1970. It, it is... Um, I cannot tell. It's all right. But anyway... Mm. Is it in, in the list here? Uh, in Johnson Steps, can I can I have look look at the sheet? No, it is mm. it is not here. It is my first book. Right. So after I wrote this, I began to acquire a taste to to write some more, and from there I, I launched into writing. But of course the first one was Calvin said that's abridgment. That is mm. not writing but mm, abridgment. Mm, yeah. mm, mm, mm. I think one of the significant features in all your writings is that you were able to translate very complex ideas into simple language. Um, is it would you how would you explain that? Well that is uh, uh studied uh, way of writing. In other words, I purposely present it in such a way that the lay reader will easily absorb. Mm -hmm. But if you have some high-flown phrase, and um, it, it may be very beautiful English, but uh, but if it doesn't hit, doesn't grip the understanding of the lay person, that is no good. But even to write it in their language, right. so that they can can easily grasp. Mm. And also, my style all comes from the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. The King James is very beautiful with balance of cadences, and I think you know. Mm -hmm. So, I write it with the help of much of King James. Right. Right. As uh, David Marshall says, mm -hmm. that King James was his literature book. Mm -hmm. He said, the King James uh, built up his English, mm -hmm. and I would say exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Did you purpose in your heart every year that you would write certain books, or does it come? Well, now as I as I grew along, I I seem to uh, have the feeling that I must write at least two books a year. Mm. <laughs> right. 
But this uh, year I may be writing three books. Mm -hmm. The one is with Jeff, a theology for every mm -hmm. Christian. Mm -hmm. And the second, my homiletics, mm -hmm. my homiletic swimming pool right. is coming out. And now it grips me to answer these Puritans, mm -hmm. very holier than vow and legalistic people, mm -hmm. the story of my Bible Presbyterian faith. I want to write it in a story. Mm -hmm. I feel that's the best way to grip them. Right. At what time of the day would you usually do your writing? In the wee hours of the morning. Mm -hmm. Usually between 2.30 to 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. It would be, it'd be interesting at this point in time to trace a day in the life of Timothy To Would you like to describe how a day is spent productively? Well, when the term is on, mm. you are regimented. Mm. When the term is off, then I've got all the liberty to, to spend my day. And uh, I don't believe that uh, you must get up at a certain time and then to do your quiet time and then uh, then it's counted as being being the standard norm mm. of uh, holiness. Mm. If I'm tired, I just sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have to keep time to... Uh, because I've been writing from 1 o'clock to 4.30. Mm. Then, if I don't go and sleep, I'll be groggy all day. Mm -hmm. I must sleep again. Mm -hmm. why, the cho why the choice of writing it in the wee hours of the morning? I don't know. You just wake up. It, it comes to be a sort of a pattern. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you go to bed, say, at 11. Mm -hmm. But by the time it's one thirty or 2 o'clock, you wake up very mm -hmm. fresh. Mm -hmm. So you take advantage of the coolness and the silence of the night to to write. Mm -hmm. And so this morning I got up at 1.30 and I wrote until 3 o'clock. Mm -hmm. This is my off hours, you know, not when we are lecturing. Mm -hmm. We are now on vacation. Mm -hmm. Is this a daily practice of yours? Well, if, there, if a book is on, then that will be more or less every night you get up and you mm -hmm. do something about it. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of uh, S.M. writing his memoirs also in the early mornings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhat like that. Yeah. When you get old, you don't uh, sleep that much. Mm. And that's an advantage. Mm. But uh, I don't care. If I like to sleep and I feel very sleepy, I just go ahead. And I think that is the secret of hell. Mm -hmm. You don't regiment yourself. If you want to sleep, just sleep. Right. And if you can sleep, all the better. Mm -hmm. But then you get up very fresh. Mm -hmm. But if you are not uh, satisfied with uh, having a good sleep, and you regimen or force yourself, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it doesn't pay. Right. And let it take its course. Right. Now, Reverend Toh, in wrapping up the history of the Life, Presbyter Life, Life Bible Presbyterian Church in Singapore, can you comment on the renewal of church leadership This is a very high mystery. Mm. I think we should thank God for Go Chok Tong. Mm -hmm. That Lee Kuan Yew has found one. And I think he is far above Lee Sien Lung. Mm -hmm. If Lee Sien Lung were to head our nation, mm. he wouldn't be going up to see Mahathir. Mm. I think. Mm -hmm. But Go Chok Tong has a way of humility and he explains it to the people. People like it. Mm -hmm. Even my brother's Malay driver, oh, go chok tong, good. Mm. Listen, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's not good for me to compare. Sure. But I think we have a wonderful successor mm. in uh, go chok tong, and I think he's ready to make a mark. Mm -hmm. In the spiritual world, it's very hard to say I've got so many assistant pastors, mm -hmm. but they just leave me some 
out of uh, ambition, some out of um, gain, mm -hmm. and I wish that I can have a successor who will hold two portfolios, mm -hmm. both pastor and principal. That's how the tradition has been established. Right. So that um, I cannot quarrel with myself. Mm. And I favor one against the other is still a left and right pockets. Right. So everything is very harmonious mm -hmm. under one head. Mm. As for me now, I have a successor in the college. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy for Dr. Jeffrey Koo. Mm because he has 100% viewpoint mm. and principle Excellent. and spirit with me. Mm. He believes in all the doctrine of BPism that I teach. I'm also very happy for the college mm. that after him, like Swan Yu and um, Jackson, Koshi, Bob, Colin, they are most they are all practically on the same wavelength. They are maybe a little bit not exactly like Jeffrey Koo. Mm. And I feel that Jeffrey will be able to pass on and we pray with a really thank God it is now thirty seven years now mm. that we have uh, maintain this line mm. without being infiltrated. There has been forces of infiltration mm -hmm. to take over, mm -hmm. but we have guarded and we have expelled and kept it pure. Mm -hmm. Under Jeffrey, I believe he will continue, so at least will last another generation. Mm -hmm. You know schools, mm -hmm. the last one generation is topple, right. very sad. Right. But for every BC, we thank God for uh, continuing. Mm -hmm. And this is very, very happy. Mm -hmm. Church, to be fair, I must wait. Right. Yeah. Mm. Would there be any conscious effort on your part to groom any particular leaders Naturally, to take over you? Every, every leader would want to groom some successor. Right. But then it's not something that uh, can come by because you wish. Mm. It must be... I, be, I believe divine intervention too. Mm -hmm. if you wish, but then you don't find the real stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. How would you, would you comment on the future trend of the BP movement in Singapore then? Future trend? Well, we are split up, we are split up. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to be number one, right? Mm -hmm. It may be as well, because it's no use to run a three-legged race. Mm -hmm. Again, so we're really all tied together, you cannot run. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good to let them free will now. Mm -hmm. Until such time, maybe one more generation. And if they see things eye to eye, mm -hmm. that they have now learned the hard way of uh, going out into the cold and each one fending for himself, and you realize this is time for us to gather together as it is a history in the English Presbyterian Church. Mm -hmm. They are very strong together, then they do do all, then finally they gather together in a revival. Let nature take its course, but I will not want to gather the people, so I must come together because uh, I don't see that there is uh, much benefit. Mm -hmm. If we do, there is still the line of of hurt somewhere mm -hmm. there and it's, it's not easily patched up. Right. And then if we try to get together with Zion, they are under a modernistic pastor, Kwik Sui Hua. Mm -hmm. He gets people from Fuller, from region. These are all the signers of the ECT. Mm -hmm. And ECT is evangelicals and Catholics together. Mm -hmm. Well, if he is for the ICC and for separation, he would not be doing But then he thinks He's very clever. He can get these people a compromise. Mm. So we cannot get together. Right. One last question for you, Reverend Toh. What would be your advice for young and aspiring pastors? 
your personal advice for young and well, inspiring pastors? First of all, he must know where the Lord calls him. Mm. It's very important. You cannot be just uh, dribbling here and there and where the pasture is greener than you go there. It's no use. And I'm very happy to learn from Kok Hyung. Because when I went, I went there two times. The first time I told him, I said, at first I asked him, I said, uh, how long you expect to stay here? He said, well, maybe five or ten years. I said, finish for you. If you say I'm going to die here, you succeed. Mm. This time I asked him, I said, what are we going to do? I'm going to die here. Okay. Mm. In other words, wherever the Lord puts us, we must know our call there and then stick to it. Mm. But there are those who are coming up, they're not very sure, and they try to work themselves up. You know. that, that sort of a thing will not work. Mm. All right. I know the Lord put me here. I, that's why I don't move. Mm. McIntyre had asked me many times come and work with me in America. I said, sorry, my place is Singapore. Mm. One of the things I know why, because I've got the Chinese languages. Mm. And there are 13 of our branches now in Malaysia. 11 are founded by me.